Diane, good morning. Welcome to the Reading Circle Microphone. Thank you. It's great to be here. Ah, great to have you. I was sharing with Diane a couple of minutes ago because we were actually talking on the phone prior to going on the air that she was recommended to me by Darlene Hunter. And those of you in the listening audience, you know, if you remember a few years ago, Darlene had a segment with me, Motivational Moments. And she would come on about 7 o'clock or so and, and do a motivational moment for three to five minutes. And, you know, we, that was a weekly part of the show. So Darlene had emailed me. Uh, back in, I think it was October or November, she said, you know, I have a great guest for you that you can have on your show. I highly recommend it. I said, darling, if you recommend it, I'll take it sight unseen. And, you know, and surely, we, so we set the date at that time, and it has come. And again, it is Diane Schnabel, and the, uh, the she is the author of Powerless America Unplugged, and it is an interactive novel. Powerless America Unplugged is an interactive, high-concept, apocalyptic thriller set in Florida. It is action-packed, realistic, and unrelenting in pace. Experienced through four main characters, the thought-provoking story pits survival instincts against morality, despair against hope, and fear against courage. Each day, new challenges, unanticipated threats, and unimaginable betrayals erode trust, blurring the line between right and wrong. And you, the reader, will face six moral dilemmas, each with life and death consequences for the characters. There's more to be read about each character, but I'm going to stop right there. Again, Diane, welcome to the Reading Circle. Where did Now, where did this come from? Wow, because this tells me if somebody with an imagination. Where did this all start? Well, the idea for the decision book actually came from my husband, who is not quite an avid reader. And we were talking one day about books that he liked when he was a kid. And they used to have these You Decide books where you would pick choice A or B, and you actually got to direct the story. The difference with those were they were like second-person stories, and one of them always led to a dead end, and, you know, you died and you'd have to go back. So we wanted to take that concept and turn it more into an adult idea where the story could continue, but if a character did die you know, the, the other characters would carry it through. So that's where the idea came from. Okay, so now we have Powerless America. And where did the concept, I mean, where did the, the storyline, how did that come about? And that's what, that's, then when I say that, I mean, just looking at that is like, just listening for the small synopsis I read, that tells me like, wow, this is some, some serious imagination going on here. Where did that start? Were you a very imaginative as a child or, or teen? Or did that come later? I like to, I like to think I was. Um, I've always had an interest in writing, and I sort of got sidetracked at a certain point in my life, and then I've come back to it. So it was pretty interesting. In February of 2013, uh, my husband decided to write a short story about a character that I had written a novel that was unpublished. And it was really funny because it really spurred me on and it got me going because I was a little bit indignant. I said, you know, my character would never do that. (laughs) My character would never say that. So it was pretty interesting because at that very same time, without his knowledge or mine, my mother was essentially doing the same thing. They were both trying to spur me back on into writing. And ironically, both of their stories had to do with loss of power. And uh, a lot of people might think that was a coincidence. I kind of called it divine intervention right? and started doing the research and learned about electromagnetic pulse. And as a child in the 80s, growing up, you know, in the middle of the Cold War, I was always concerned about nuclear weapons. You know, the prospect of a single nuclear bomb annihilating a U.S. city was frightening. But the prospect of that same bomb detonating at altitude and wiping out 90 percent of the U.S. population was terrifying. And then I learned that many Americans weren't even aware of the threat. And it was more troubling because our enemies are keenly aware of that vulnerability. Oh, absolutely. If you look historically, I mean, that was one of the the biggest fears of John F. Kennedy. If you in any most of if not all of the books that I've read on Kennedy goes into this whole thing with him and Khrushchev and, and Russia and the USSR. And his one of his main fears was that that button would be hit. And like you said, the majority of the population on both ends would be wiped out. And that is still a threat today, probably even more so, because our technology and weaponry and and the electromagnetic fields and all that is even more advanced than it was then. So That's right. We're very dependent now on technology and, and electricity. Right. 
Is that an? What is that? It's, let me. See, I'm looking at the book cover, and I'm looking like in between the circle. The okay, that's a that's a rifle that's going through. That's a tar- okay. It's the United States, a target overlaid over a rifle. Actually, the the target is actually on a little electrical outlet, which is on top of the United States. So the target is actually on the electrical wall outlet. Right. That's right. I see it. Now that you say that, I see it because it joins a little white outlet. So you got the target, the outlet, the United States. And then, like I said, I was trying to make out the, the it's all laid on top of a gun. I wasn't sure if that was the back of a plane or if that was the butt of the gun. And now I'm looking at it's the, it's the barrel of the gun. Right. Because what happens once the electromagnetic pulse hits and communications are lost and transportation is lost, you also lose rule of law, right? Which means any fanatics or you know radical terrorists wannabes are going to you know step up and have you know, open season. So the rifle is actually representing that terrorist faction. Essentially, I've had an EMP and then dumped ISIS into your backyard. Right, and see, I always get into covers, especially when I mean because this one leaps out at me. I mean, I'm always interested. There's a few things I'm interested in: wordplay and covers, because your cover sends a message whether you have words on it or not. If you were to take all your words out and just had that cover, it's still sending a message. The fact that you have the electric outlet, the United States, the target, the gun, so forth, is still sending a message. What came to mind is years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago now, maybe a little bit less than that, they, we did have a section of it was a blackout. And it, it ran a grid from like Canada all the way out to like Ohio or somewhere in middle America and the whole eastern corridor, northeastern corridor, it was all blacked out. And it does cause one to wonder if the enemies were to get a hold of those various grids and was to destroy them, they would render us really kind of powerless. <laughs> exactly, and hence the title. And the Northeast Blackout of 2003... That's when it was. ...a wake-up call. Right. That's, exa- that's exactly when it was. Because I, was, I remember, because my kids were little, and th- at that point, that's when computer games and all that really was kind of taking off. And... Of course, we had no electricity, so you didn't have no computer. In and they literally had to go outside and play a game with a ball. And I remember them tossing the ball around as if like, wow, we really didn't know how to play with these kind of toys anymore. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because, they, <laughs> because they didn't have the electricity. They couldn't play on the computer. They couldn't listen to music. They couldn't. So we literally were sitting out on the porch and they were they had this ball that they came and they started playing catch with the ball. And, but it does render us that kind of that, and, and I'm in terms of being powerless. And it says America unplugged. And it, what's really interesting is you made it interactive. So how did how does it become interactive? You reach a point in the story where the character is faced with a moral dilemma, and they have to decide: Do I want to do A or do I want to do B? And a lot of them are really tough decisions. You know, right or wrong. You know, it could be that you're in a situation where you have to do you defend yourself and shoot someone or do you take your chances? Do you protect your family? So it puts you, the reader, really tried to put you into that situation. I really tried to make the reader feel what it would be like to live under this circumstance. So I really wanted you to feel the, the tension and the angst that I felt when I was trying to decide what is the right thing for this character to do in this situation? What would I do? And it it really worked out because this novel just had so many moral dilemmas in it that it it was just set up perfectly to become a decision book. And what's fascinating, again, for me in terms of the concept, especially with what you're dealing with morality, is because in my interview in the last hour, I was just sharing with how it seems that the country is just on a dive, just where like anything at this point, for the most part, goes. I mean things that are going on in the media and television and with people that just would not have occurred 40 or 50 years ago is kind of like old hat now, like everyday occurrences. And so for now to have a book that's kind of like, you need to really look at this and choose. What would you do? What, what do you feel would be the right thing to do if there is such a thing as the right thing and the wrong thing? So in terms of now putting this together, I'm seeing here how your characters in the synopsis for Amazon, you actually describe each character. When you were, when you were doing character development, did your how did how did that happen? How did you get to Kyle Murphy has the perfect life, health, wealth, a loving wife, teenage daughter until the unthinkable happens? How did you get to Kyle and Bradley and Abby 
And um, I want to hear in terms of your experiences with character development because various authors I've interviewed, character development is always interesting to me in terms of for some, the characters actually eat, sleep, walk, talk with them. For others, they do other things. What was it like for you trying to develop these? Well, it was interesting that Kyle Murphy character actually existed from that previous unpublished novel. That's the character that my husband took when he wrote his little 28-page story. So that character, I actually had his backstory and history, which I used from the previous book, and I built around that. And I, I tend to be interested in female characters who are non-traditional. So we have a 15-year-old girl who is a rifle aficionado and, and wants to be a Marine Corps sniper. So that, that really sets her apart. And I started with that concept and said, okay, well, what kind of personality would that person have to have? What kind of traits would they have to have to succeed? Uh, so I worked her character that way. And it was pretty interesting because soon after that, uh, Sarah Merkel actually testified before Congress uh, regarding gun rights because she was actually a competition rifle shooter. So I kind of took that as another God wink that, yes, go keep going in this direction. Uh, the character of Bradley, I needed a, a hero. So, you know, I brought in a Bradley, who happens to be a Marine Corps sniper. And there's a romantic kind of war-crossed lover story that goes on between the two of them. And then the character of Ryan Andrews started out as a joke. Um, I was home. I was a teacher at the time when I started writing. So I was home from school one day, and I decided to write this, you know, point of view, this character. And just, you know, to be funny, I named him Ryan Andrews, and I kind of gave him my husband's personality and character traits. And I read it to him when, when he got home, and I kind of liked the guy. I just kind of fell in love with him. So he kind of stayed as a character and was woven <laughs> all throughout the book. <laughs> so do they, how did you, like, did they talk to you or as you were developing them throughout the story? How did you come up with what happened with each one or how they interacted with each other? Well, it was really situational driven. And I looked at a lot of things that had transpired in history and, and pulled from that when I brought things in. For example, there's a situation where they have to deal with cannibalism. Okay, let's right, go back okay. in history, you know, and see where that happened and how right. people dealt with it. So basically, I kind of developed their personalities and then had to really think about how they would react in that situation because everybody doesn't react the same way. And the genre, is this like sci-fi, or what genre does this fall under? Uh, some people would classify it under sci-fi. I kind of think of it as a thriller. Okay. Um, some people might classify it as um, apocalyptic okay. or dystopian. Um, but it isn't really science fiction. That's the thing. And ENT okay. is not science fiction. It is science fact. Okay. If you have just joined us, we're doing an extended version or a reading circle double header. My guest in this hour is Diane Schnabel, and her book is Powerless Unplugged. America, rather, Unplugged. Powerless America Unplugged. We're getting ready to share some information with you, but you know what to do. Get on all your social media sites, text somebody, tweet somebody, get on all of them, and let them know that Diane is on the air with me. And we're talking about a book, like she just said. It could happen because if you go back to 2003, a large segment of the United States and some parts of Canada was blacked out when this particular center or transformer or whatever they call those things, when it went awry, it took out a good portion of the country, which would let one know and lead one to believe that if if our enemies truly wanted to get at us, they could get at those different locations if they figure them out in the way they are, which probably is not that hard to do in 2016. And it would be catastrophic. So as she say, apocalyptic, apocalyptic, yes, it would be just that. Because I remember what it was like when all the electricity went off in 2003. I remember it vividly. Because as I was sharing with you a couple of minutes ago, my kids didn't know what to do. <laughs> because they had become so accustomed to using electronics that now whenever all the electronics were shut down, they had to go back and play with the old-fashioned toys. So that's just one small example of what life could be. And that was only for a few hours. Imagine if we were under attack or under a war, it would be life like we've never seen it. So Powerless, America Unplugged, the author is Diane Schnabel. 
She will be right back. We're not going anywhere. You know what to do. I'm just going to share some information with you. But while I'm doing that, you share information with all of your contacts. Share your influence. Tell them to listen in on the Reading Circle on GoBrave.org and WP88.7 FM. The thought of my sons growing up without me inspired me to quit smoking. I talked to my doctors and then I threw away all my cigarettes, ashtrays, and lighters. I started exercising instead of smoking. Staying away from alcohol when I was first quitting was key. I kept on trying, learned something each time. Do whatever it takes. No matter how many times it takes. We did it, so can you. For free help, call 1-800-QUIT-NOW. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and CDC. We got adopted. Over the years, I came to know what really happened. She had us when she was 17. The way she saw things going, it wasn't a good environment to raise a kid. The fact that she did that just shows how strong of a woman my mother is, and I thank her each and every day for it. I wouldn't be the person who I am today, and I like the person I am today. I knew I was loved, and I was part of a family, so that was what's important to me. For more information, visit ichooseadoption.org. I'm Christoph. And I'm Christopher. And our mom chose adoption. And on the seventh day, twas created the Sunday morning edition of The Naked Brunch. Nowhere else will you find rock, folk, bubblegum, and prog all in one neatly created package. That's The Naked Brunch. And the music is the star of the show. How you doing? G-Man checking in. I hope you'll join me Sunday mornings and experience radio the way it used to be. Experience music the way it used to be. Experience the magic and power of radio as it was back in the glory days of the 60s and 70s. Music, it's the soundtrack of your life. I'll play your soundtrack every Sunday, live and in color, as host of The Naked Brunch, starting at 9 a.m. Isn't it about time you came home? All right, this is a Reading Circle double header, And my guest this morning in this hour is Diane Schnabel, and she's the author of Powerless America Unplugged. And the scenario, or the concept, is something that could be the unthinkable, yet at the same time, possible. <laughs> and that is the whole notion of the electromagnetic, what do you call it, the electromagnetic sphere? Extra, electromagnetic pulse. The electromagnetic pulse, there we go. And that pretty much would be, you know, if something were to damage or to destroy our ability to have our electricity. So when did you do your writing? Did you do your writing, like, I mean, for, it varies by author. Some are early morning, some are late night. For you, when, when did you get a chance to pull this together? Well, like I said, I started writing it when I was still teaching, so I would scramble every minute that I possibly could uh, to work on it, a lot of time in the summers and at night, weekends, and I just couldn't wait to get back to it. Did you or have your students or any of your former students that you taught, have they, do they have copies or seen the copies of the book? Uh, I don't know. I left teaching two years ago before I published it, so I'm not really sure. I'm not really in contact with any of them. I hope they are. I hope they're aware of it. So you haven't gone back to the school with the book then? No, I haven't. The reason I asked that is because when the, there was a point in the show's history where I was doing it on Friday mornings from 6 to 7.30. And sometimes my guests would actually come live into the studio and I would ask them, you know, what are you doing when we're done with the interview? And they said, oh, I'm just going to have that breakfast. I'm going to do this, that, and the other. And I would ask them, you know, do me a favor, would you? Because I was a teacher at that time as well, teaching. And I so said, would you come with me to my school so the kids can meet you? And Diane, when they had the opportunity to put the author and the book together, it would flip them out. <laughs> they couldn't believe they were sitting there, you know, in the same presence of, of someone like an author. You know, because, you know, the book usually have the author's picture or either their name or something on the back. They, they, that would just like, like that, that would wow them. <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> 
It really would. So did anything as you were because all right, when you're putting together a, a story like this, that even though it's a novel, obviously you have to do some research. Did sure. anything kind of surprise you as you were doing your research to put the book together? Actually, a lot of things really surprised me. The whole process of how this could work, um, basically, uh, the concept of high altitude uh, nuclear tests were done in the '60s, and that's when the EMP effect was discovered. So basically, when a nuclear bomb detonates at high altitude, the explosion literally strips electrons from the molecules, and it creates like this deluge of charged particles called the Compton effect. And because our power grid is 200,000 miles of high-tension electric lines, it acts like a massive antenna. So it's going to funnel in all that excessive voltage directly into our transformers. And unlike the power outage in 2003, it is going to permanently destroy them. And this is a serious problem because one high-capacity transformer right now can take months to requisition. Right. Their manufacturer has been largely outsourced to foreign nations. So when we talk about this type of power loss, we're not talking about a few hours and we're not talking about a few days. We're talking about one to two years. So literally, when you say powerless, and see, that's where I tell you, I always love to play on words. So there's definitely double entendre there. Whenever you say powerless, we're talking powerless in terms of electric power, and we're talking powerless in terms of anything we could do about it. (laughs) Exactly, because you're going to lose transportation, communications, banking, commerce. Right now, our stores use a just-in-time inventory system, so they don't have a stockpile of food, you know, in the back of Publix like they used to, you know, decades ago. You're going to lose water, sanitation. I mean, try to imagine all of that being gone, no medications, nothing, no 911, no doctors, no hospitals. It, it's a terrifying prospect. And this is, but, this is as you said, for this is not for a week or a few days. This is for like years. What, if, what would actually, uh, again, happen to beyond the, the fact that you can't have any of these services? Would anything happen to the actual human being, him or herself? No, so, no, it's, it's the research that I've done suggests that it wouldn't really have an effect on, on human beings. It would affect anything that has, you know, an electronic circuit board or a chip in it. Ooh, what that's happens everything. Is, exactly. <laughs> it, the E1 component of the wave is so fast that it goes past the fuses and surge protectors, and they, they can't stop it. The only way to really protect anything is through a Faraday cage, which is basically a solid metal box. And see, this is interesting in terms of us being so reliant on technology. I mean, it is when any time a few months ago, my cell phone was stolen and it was like, oh, my God. I mean, I didn't know how I could live without it. I mean, I had to immediately get it replaced. And it's like even if they go down, even if your server goes down or even if something that you've now just how did I ever live without this? You really kind of like feel like helpless. Like, I mean, we've, we're a nation. I mean, I'm probably a world of fiddlers now. You can't go anywhere without somebody's their thumbs. That's all you see going is their head down and thumbs moving. <laughs> Correct. This is at restaurants. This is on, you know, on the train station, wherever you go. Everybody's fiddling with that phone. So I can't imagine that all of that would be wiped out. You do the microwaves, your refrigerators, your your stoves, everything, because everything is tied into a chip one way or the other. Exactly. And we're just extremely dependent. And, you know, you grow up in this world and you think it's so robust and so strong. And then you find out that it's actually quite fragile. Very vulnerable. Very fragile. So I see you have the video trailer on YouTube. Any thoughts for a film? Uh, I would love it if somebody wanted to to take that idea and run with it. Uh, I'm not exactly a filmmaker, but you never know. The whole point of this really is to try to bring awareness to people and make sure they know about electromagnetic pulse because, you know, a rogue nation or a terrorist, you know, detonating a nuclear bomb is not the only way we could end up in that situation. There's also solar flares. And, you know, most experts will tell you it's just a matter of time before the sun produces a powerful enough coronal mass ejection that would generate a similar deluge of charged particles and affect the uh, transformers. Wow. So, but and you put this in a way where folks would want to read it because one of the, one of the biggest challenges... Matter of fact, before I even say that, who is your target audience for this? What age group, if there is any? 
I would say probably uh, 18 through 75, maybe. Okay. I don't know. 18 and up. Okay. Because where I was going, it's one of the reasons this show even came about 15 years ago was to try to encourage people to read more. And it is very difficult. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not because still the bookstores are full when I go in. And I know the electronic readers are doing well. Not, actually, I saw a report last week that the, the bookstores are still outpacing them. And they thought it was going to be just the opposite. But the, the old fashioned book in hand is still outpacing the ebook. But it, in general, it's, it's difficult, especially with all the other distractions, such as I was just talking about the fiddling with the phones, to get people to sit down and read a book. So this seems to me that there's a storyline or a concept that would be very engaging. I would I would like to think so. I've had friends suggest it would make an interesting weekly TV series where people could actually phone in and vote, you know, for each decision and each choice to see what would happen. And I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, I mean, because again, whenever you say it's interactive, because I'm, I'm looking here at the bottom of the, of the description, it says six dilemmas, 64 paths, will you make the right decisions? And so even that alone ought to keep folks kind of engaged in the book. They want to read to see what's going to happen next. Exactly. I'm really trying to put you into that world and make you feel like essentially it's a time machine. You know, an EMP would be a time machine taking you back, you know, 150 years. Wow. The difference is right now we're not all prepared, you know, to live in an agrarian kind of society where we grow our own food and can find our own water. Right. But this is, I mean, I'm sitting here, the more that I'm reading this and looking at it, this is an extremely interesting concept. And you're right, at any time, we're vulnerable for, because most of the time we think of, like you said, nuclear. That's the, that's the first thing that comes to everybody's mind is the nuclear. But there are, there are so many others that are like our water lines. I mean, we look at what happened in Flint, Michigan, with the whole thing with the lead in the water. And you look, I mean, there are, there are ways if folks want to get us, they can get us. And vice versa. There are ways that if we want to get other folks, we can get other folks. But it's just, you know, thankfully, that has not occurred. But it could occur. And so the fact that you're, you know, trying to raise awareness, that's a good thing. And I would think those who are like, especially like the Trekkie audience, the ones that are really like Star Trek and, and all those different shows. Um, what's the one that was just came back out again? Uh, Star Wars. I would think this would be attractive to them. I would like to think so. <laughs> So what was it? You're a teacher, and and that we can definitely relate. No, no. Once a teacher, always a teacher. (laughs) It it doesn't. (laughs) Never ever do you not be a teacher once you're a teacher. But I'm teasingly, and I'm saying that in jest, especially since I'm in education. But what was the process like for you now in terms of you know? Do you decided I always like to write, but now I'm getting ready to put it in book format in terms of getting it published and edited and so forth and so on. What was that process like for you? Uh, the editing process was pretty daunting because with so many paths, like if you read the the book one path through, you're approximately 108,000 words, you know, 374 pages. However, when you put all the different paths and all the different options together, it's 1,240,000 words, which is a, a much bigger deal when it comes to proofing. And as far as hiring an editor, even at you know, three cents per word, you know, that would cost me $37,000. Right. You know, wasn't feasible. So, you know, I had to do it the old fashioned way, relying on my mom and and God, basically. I'd sit down and say, okay, I'm going to read through this. Please help me find any mistakes. And I found that reading very slowly and monotone and trying to read only what's there was really helpful because it's those missing and extraneous words that are the toughest to catch, at least for me. No, no, for most people, because you know what? Our minds are wonderful, phenomenal things. They will actually see what's not there because it's supposed to be there. And that happens in reading quite... That's why it's really like writing emails and stuff like that. You really have to prove them because your mind... You know what you were saying in your mind when you were writing it. So when you now go back to read it, your mind automatically assumes it's there and actually sees it. And it's not until another eye gets on it when it says you missed the word is there, you missed are, you missed that, you missed this. So, yeah, you're, you're right. It, it really one of the tricks people got learned years ago was to read your paragraph backwards. To start to try that to, to read instead of read, because, again, your brain associates what's supposed to be there. 
and and makes it be there even though it's not so when you read it backwards now that forces the brain to say wait a minute <laughs> It, it positive, but but it is a daunting task. So, did you self-publish? Yes, I did. Ah, and what was that like? Uh, I found the process to be uh, pretty straightforward. You know, dealing with Amazon and Kindle. The biggest problem that I had was with the uh, sample because they like to do a ten percent sample, right? And for most books, that's perfect. But you know, minus three thousand pages, and it's you know, path A, path B, path C. So when you take 10%, you're essentially almost giving away all of path A. So if, if someone wants to say yes to every decision, they're essentially reading the entire book for, for free. So it took a while to, you know, get Amazon and Kindle to, to come on board and adjust that percentage. But other than that, it, I found the, the process to be uh, very welcoming and, and very straightforward. Uh, like I said, I wrote a previous novel that I didn't publish uh, back in the 90s, and I, I found the whole query letter, rejection letter right. uh, process to be very frustrating. Right. So it's really some great opportunities now for new authors to get out there. No, it really is, and we say that all the time here in terms of 30, 40, 20, 25, 30 years ago, you did not have that option. You had to go through the publishing houses, the queries, and the rejection letters, and you might go through hundreds of them before somebody says, you know what, we'll take your manuscript. And But even when that happens... A lot of times you lose some control on your covers or your wording or your titles or whatever. Sometimes the publishing house will say, well, we want to say this because we think it'll sell better if it's that. But when you self-publish, you kind of can do your own thing. Exactly. So speaking of covers, did you design this or did you have someone you know designed it? Or how did you come up with that concept? Actually, I designed it. Um, I was just trying to come up with something that would convey symbolically everything that's going on so you know because there are snipers in the story obviously the crosshairs and you know the, the rings could be you know perceived to be part of the crosshairs they could also be perceived as the the, the pulse going out uh, and you know i just tried to it was affecting the whole country so we had the united states in there and again we put the gun in there to symbolize the the ISIS style attacks that w would be going on as well. Right. So I was just trying to encompass everything in a picture. Don't know if it, if it works, but that no, it really does because it, all of that it speaks to all of that. Matter of fact, the fact that you just said the the rings, I hadn't even picked up on that piece in terms of the the magnetic feel you know, doing its thing. I saw it as, I know, I was in the military, so I remember we had to do target practice, and the, the target was just like that. It was the, the crosshair with the circles. And, you know, right. what, you, what you were doing was the closer you got to the, the middle ring, the closer that would have been, I guess, to, you, to the heart or what have you. <laughs> and then Correct. the further out you go. So, so now you said it's beyond just the target. It's also symbolizing the magnetic field. So, so yeah, see, I mean, I said this last week when I was, I was talking with a guest. There is nothing that's done in books and everything that's done by happenstance. The average reader that walks into the bookstore, pick up the book and, and skim it or browse it, they don't really know that everything in that design was done on purpose. It's true. Most people don't, probably don't think about it. They just take it for granted. Right. They, 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 you know, oh, yeah, that's nice coverage. Not realizing there's so many different subliminals that are put in there intentionally. And that's what I see here because you just, you just said, okay, I wanted this, I wanted that. What has been the feedback from folks that you know that have read the book? I mean, have you had folks that say, wow, well, you know, I didn't... Well, sometimes, like, people don't who don't know you is like, wow, I didn't realize something like that could come out of you. I didn't know you thought like that or that was your thought process. What kind of feedback have you gotten from folks who've read the book? I think I've pretty much terrified everyone who's read it. <laughs> I think that would, that would sum it up. <laughs> they, they terrified them. <laughs> Well, seriously, the people had no idea they'd never heard of an electromagnetic right. pulse. And when they realized that, you know, their way of life could evaporate in an instant, you know, that, that's a tough thing to wrap your mind around. Well, and, yeah, and it is. To a certain degree, that, that was the effect I wanted to provoke. I really wanted people to realize that, hey, there really is an existential threat out there. Right. And we can do something about it, and we're not. So... You know, I thought if more people, if the American people really knew how 
you know, severe or how dire the threat was. Right. I mean, it may be a low probability incident, but it's definitely a, a high, you know, consequence incident. I think if, if most Americans understood the threat, I think Congress would actually do something to protect the grid. So that's that's part of generating the awareness, because we can do something to defend against this. And, you know, like I said, whether it's a, a nuclear bomb that's terrorist related or rogue, rogue state, whether it's a solar flare or whether it's even a cyber attack, you know, there are steps and measures that could be taken to protect the grid, and it's not being done, at least not yet. And see, in 2016, I could see why folks would be terrified because any of that is a possibility. I mean, there's some things that have gone on that years ago you would, would not have come to your mind even with Hurricane Katrina, going back when that happened, folks were saying the same thing, that that could have been prevented had some other things been put in place ahead of time in terms of the dams and the the levees and so forth and so on. So I'm kind of hearing that same kind of thing coming out of you saying, you know what, folks, there's some things that we could do to head this off. The likelihood of it would be extremely slim, but if it does happen, oh boy. <laughs> Exactly. And I'll give you an example of terrifying uh, with my mother, because obviously she was reading it, you know, chapter by chapter as I was writing it. And she called me up and said, you know, I spent about an hour standing in front of my pantry, staring into it, saying, oh, God, what would I do? And, you know, it just it hits people in different ways. All right. And that, that's just an example of how it hit her. Now, okay, whenever we start talking apocalyptic, is this something along the same lines of like the Left Behind silly series? Uh, no, it's there's there's an undertone of of, of God in it. And okay. the characters believe, but it's not a religious book. Okay, but you know, one character has a saying that the Good Lord always provides, and that kind of feeds through and okay. and carries them through the difficult moments. But no, I, I would say it's drastically different um, okay. from the Left Behind series. And you said this was a trilogy as well, so that means there's more coming? Correct. The second one is already out. It's called Empowered, with a capital E-M-P, America Re-Energized. And this one kind of picks up where Powerless left off, and this is where we're trying to put the country back together again. And I describe it as the American Revolution meets Big Brother. And it contains... <laughs> It contains 14 historical tidbits, I call them. You know how a painter will hide little pictures within a bigger picture? Right. Okay, well, I've, I've taken historical people and events that shaped who we are as a nation and woven them into the story in, in such a way that some are good and some are bad. But there are things that some of them I never knew and I never learned about in school, but I thought were important and I would have liked to have learned about. Right. Some of them are, are, are well known. Eleven of them are from the Revolutionary War era. So it really almost turns the tables here and, you know, it really makes you look at, you know, what's right, what's wrong, what's worth fighting for, what's not. So in Empowered takes you through and you find out who's really behind the EMP and who, who actually did this. And then the third one, which I'm currently working on, which hopefully will be out at the end of the year, is going to be called Power Play, America's State. And in that one, it's going to be a combination of the two. Uh, it'll be a decision book with some historical tidbits in it. And the reader will actually make choices there. And you get to determine the fate of the United States. So if you make wise decisions as you know the leader, the country will survive. And if you make poor decisions country may not survive wow. and you know you'll have the potential to actually you know kill off the four main characters you know if if you don't make the right decisions so so but that, let me put a let me put a caveat on that if you do kill off a character you do have a chance to go back i have a, a button called change of heart where you can actually go back <laughs> to the previous decision and go the other way so you do have that option <laughs> Let's say now someone reads Powerless and they figured out this whole thing about EMP and they figured out that, whoa, wait a minute, this could happen. And now they want to get in touch with someone in, in power, for lack of a better word, no pun intended. What steps should they take? Should they write their Congress people? Should they write Senate? Or, and, and if they do, what would they be telling them? Uh, right now, there's a bill under consideration, the Grid Modernization Bill. 
uh, H.R. 8, which has just come out of the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee. And, uh, you know, call your call your senator, call your congressman, tell them it's an important issue, because the problem is, is there are no lobbyists out there pounding these guys and contributing money to their campaigns to get them to take care of this issue. So a lot of bills have been brought. A few have actually passed the House and they've just stalled in the Senate and they haven't right. acted on them. That's and yes, it would it would be expensive. Probably, I think estimates are around two billion dollars. But, you know, if you look at two billion compared to the 19 trillion that we already are in debt, you know, it just doesn't seem like it's that much. Well, if you look at it from the standpoint of what it because, see, this is this is what we tend to do. And that's why I use the example of Hurricane Katrina. We kind of sit back and say, oh, that'll never happen. (laughs) And then once it happens, then everybody's singing a different tune. So we kind of, oh, no, this will never happen. And we don't put measures in place. And then it happens. And then now where everybody's like, what went wrong? The old WWW, what went wrong? Well, what went wrong is when people were trying to, you know, red flag you, everybody thought it couldn't happen. I'm to the point now where I never say this cannot happen to me or this can't happen here. uh, Because that's the other thing. We didn't think that could happen here. Uh, It can happen here. (laughs) Uh, I think we take that on in many instances. I know a lot of times on the news, it's, it's rare that something that goes on um, in, a, in a suburb or a rural part that whoever they interview will say, we didn't think that could happen here. And he's like, well, that's why it happened there, because the folks that did it know that you all are sitting around thinking we didn't think it could happen here. If you take that to a country level, that's why I believe personally that's one of the factors of why we got hit with 9-11 because we had come become so complacent that now oh, that can't happen here that happens in other countries that's in other parts of the world that can't happen here and the enemies picked up on that and the same thing could happen here with this emp because we're so busy sitting around saying no that what that can't happen here that won't happen here we're the united states of america we're tough we're strong we're this we're that it could happen so I think, as you say, if we raise awareness and folks start writing letters and picking up phones, um, you said two billion, approximately two billion dollars. Yes. Okay, that's less than the wall Donald Trump wants to build. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, <laughs> so probably a lot less. <laughs> that's less than that. And again, it, the the dangers of this would be catastrophic. And I, like I said, I was there when that little grid went down in Ohio or wherever it was, somewhere in that corridor. But it went all the way from Canada down. And it was only for a few hours. And here you're talking two or three years. <laughs> yeah, they they determined that was probably related to a software bug. But it was pretty interesting because that happened on August 14th. Uh-huh. August 28th of that year, there was a very large blackout in England. And on September 29th, there was another large blackout in Italy that affected 56 million people. So I don't know if it was the same software bug, but it, it affected a lot more than just the United States, which which a lot of people don't even realize. Wow. And sometimes you wonder if some of these things aren't just a test. And, you know, you know, the, it's being caused by folks who are testing the system to see whenever we do the real thing, what it's going to be like. We just you just never know today. You just really don't. Yeah. And that, that was true in uh, April of 2013. There was a sniper assault on a California power substation. Mm-hmm. And one or two guys shot with rifles for 19 minutes, and they knocked out 17 transformers. Oh, they were good you know, shots. It, um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's just showing you the vulnerability. Exactly. You know, they know that the, the transformers are that that key linchpin, that's the problem. Right. Because it takes so long to get those transformers back. And, you know, I delve into other issues with, you know, we all witnessed what happened at Fukushima right. when the, pow- the nuclear power plant lost power. And I ask you, what would happen in this country when 104 nuclear power plants lose power and cannot cool what they need to cool? So, you know, these are the things that we look at in the book. And yeah, it, it, I would I would say terrifying is probably a really, really good word for it. But I think you're better off knowing about a threat than being oblivious to it. Clearly, because if you know about it, you can prepare. Absolutely. So when everything was said and done, and you now had a copy of Powerless in your hands, because this is, is I know it's available in e version, but it's also available in paperback. 
It is. The paperback only has uh, one choice at the very end, so essentially you have two different potential endings because it was just not feasible to have a 3,000-page paperback. <laughs> it would just be, you know, a little bit a little bit too much. <laughs> So what was it like for you when you opened up the box with the paperbacks, when you picked it up and put it in your hand and the cover that you designed was on there, your name is on there? What was that like for you? It was one of the most amazing moments. It was it was like seeing a dream come true. I think I was bouncing off the walls for hours. <laughs> Now, that's, I don't have standard questions per se, but I do ask that one just about every week because it is interesting and it's fun to hear people try to describe that feeling that you really can't put into words. It that's is a true. feeling like no other. And, it, and I always try to see, okay, let me see how this author is going to describe that feeling. And people said the same. They use the same. Like, like it was like giving birth. It's like, oh, I had a child. It was, I can't believe it. Uh, the author that I had earlier said sheer ecstasy. Uh, it was, I mean, it, and I can relate because I had that same experience with a music, with music CDs. I've done two music CDs and whenever the box comes to me and I actually see the CD shrink wrapped and my title and name and the tracks on the back. It it's hard to put into words what that feeling is like. There's, you know, something has come through you that you're sharing with the rest of the world, because this book will actually be here whenever you're not. When we're gone, this book will still be here. It'll be somewhere, because books once they're out in print, they never really die. They they just kind of move around. They're in folks' trunks and in their attics and in their basements and on their bookshelves and in this book giveaway. And it gets passed along. And, it, and all the while, that's you. So someone in there is going to have Diane Schnabel in their hand, you know, 15, 20, 30 years from now, whether you know it or not. It's quite a legacy, huh? It really is. It really is. And, and I had an author that, the reason I, I'm repeating, because I had an author that said that to me one time, that they came across a book that was written like, 90, 80, 90 years ago and, and the author had since gone on but uh, it turned out that they knew a relative of the author or something like that and they couldn't believe it and it was like so right when you start talking legacy that's exactly what it is so at this point in the interview I turn the microphone over to the author and he or she has the opportunity to promote in terms of any book signings, websites, how they can get the book, how they can get in touch with you. You can say anything except the dollar amount. Any shout outs you want to do, any particular person you want to shout out, the mic is yours to do all of the above. Okay, I just want to say Powerless America Unplugged is the story of an unprepared Florida family. It's not a prepper story. Uh, there are several EMP books out where the characters are trying to get home they're stranded somewhere else it's not that type of the story uh i do have an excerpt that i'm a short excerpt i'm going to read oh great um, four cell phones chimed simultaneously abby reached for hers and stared down at the screen seemingly confused what's allahu akbar kyle plucked it from his daughter's hand the text appeared to have been sent by their service provider hackers he wondered aloud before anyone could respond, the hanging light above the table flickered and snapped off. The restaurant had lost power. Kyle's thoughts were jumbled. Fuel depots were burning in 24 states. Natural gas pipelines were exploding nationwide. Allahu Akbar, and now the power was out? Is this a terrorist attack, he asked. Frowning at Georgia's cell phone, Bradley mumbled something indistinguishable. Then his gaze swept the restaurant. What is he looking for? Kyle traced the Marines' line of sight to the window facing Trent Street. Several cars had collided. Others had stopped for no apparent reason. And stranded drivers were wandering in the street, their bewildered stares oscillating between their cell phones and vehicles. Did they get the same text message, Kyle wondered? And why did so many drivers stop? Through peripheral vision, he saw George reach into his pocket and pass something to Bradley beneath the table. The Marine excused himself, and Will sprung from his chair. I'll go with you. You're not leaving, are you? Abby asked, eyes following Bradley. No, I'll be right back. George was fixated on the peculiar traffic jam. Between the propped open hoods of vehicles, people began scurrying toward a 1970s Volkswagen Beetle that was weaving through the gridlock. Questions tumbled through Kyle's mind. What caused all the accidents? Why was an old relic the only car moving? 
queasiness splits his stomach. If finance companies could remotely kill car engines over non-payment, could terrorists hack into vehicles and do the same? That would explain all the accidents and breakdowns. It also meant that his car wouldn't start, and neither would his wife, Jessie's. Would his family have to walk almost 20 miles from Windermere to Sugar Lake? Bradley returned, somber-faced, and with a slight shake of his head, he placed car keys in front of George. The general took a deep breath as though he had received awful news. Will's old Dodge Power Wagon is good to go, Bradley said, and he offered us a ride. George's brow relaxed a smidgen. Then we should head home. I've got some burgers we can grill. As they exited the restaurant, Kyle noticed pillars of black smoke rising over Orlando. His scalp prickled. I doubt your car will start, Bradley told him, but you can give it a try. What is going on? Kyle demanded, his tone trumpeting the panic welling inside him. Bradley rested a hand on his shoulder. Mr. Murphy, get whatever you need from your vehicle and... The Marine's jaw dropped. His eyes widened. Kyle spun around. A few hundred feet overhead, a commercial airliner was descending, engines silent. The only sound, a macabre swoosh of displaced air. Stupefied, he watched the wing's tip strike a four-story hotel. The aircraft cartwheeled, then burst into flames. Well, you know, it's it's funny that you got to the point with the airplane, because as you were talking about the cars, because I love airplanes. I love aircraft, aviation stories, movies, so forth and so on. And what came to my mind was I remember reading a movie, reading a book or either seeing a movie about... Uh, and airplanes being taken over by terrorists and using kind of like the same technology. And at that point, I was thinking that you talked about them seeing the plane coming down. But wow, that's that's surreal in terms because you didn't even, whenever we were talking, you didn't even think about cars because we said everything has a chip. You didn't think about cars and, and everything would just come to a grinding halt. Exactly. And this this will put it in, into perspective for you. And I just want to say that the ebook version is available through Kindle and Kindle Unlimited. And the paperback version, version is available at Amazon. And again, that one only has one moral dilemma with two possible endings. And, uh, you know, you can answer the question, are you strong enough physically, emotionally, and spiritually to survive in a powerless world? And if this novel scares you, contact your congressman and tell them to protect our electrical grid to make sure that this story never enters the realm of nonfiction. And then I'd just like to give a shout-out to Darlene Hunter, an amazing woman who blesses everyone she touches. And thanks to our active-duty military and veterans for keeping us safe. God bless. Absolutely. I could not have wrapped up any better. You're absolutely on point. And I'm glad, because we did talk about it and had the question, I'm glad the book has a call to action, which is, right, exactly. Get in touch with Congress. Get in touch with Senate. It's an issue most people probably won't think of until they read a book like this. But that is, wow, that is, that is just that little extra. I'm sitting there, I close my eyes because I like to do the audio books as well. So I'm sitting here pretending like I'm listening to an audio book. And you definitely piqued my, piqued my curiosity. So I will wind up downloading it before the day is out and get started reading on it tonight. Uh, the book is Powerless, America Unplugged. The author is Diane Schnabel. That's S-C-H-N-A-B-E-L. I encourage you to get the book, and then beyond getting the book is contacting your Congress or Senator and let them know about the electromagnetic grid. Diane, thank you so much for rising to join me this morning. Had a wonderful time. The If all of the chips and everything and the equipment here is working properly and didn't get slammed down, it's been recorded. <laughs> and, I will, and I will email the link to you, and you can use it in any manner you wish. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Same here. Take care now. Bye-bye. Bye now.